Well, hello, my friends, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we are watching Star Trek Lower Decks Season 1, Episode 5 already, Cupid's Errant Arrow. All right, so I saw the title, Cupid's Errant Arrow, and I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I am a huge, huge sucker for romance or blossoming relationships or, you know, the hint of something that could exist in a world that it shouldn't, you know, that 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 love in the age of cholera type of thing. Um, and I view Star Trek with, you know, constant sort of life and death situations, even in Lower Decks, to be something like that. You know, and I like that the way that the writers have sort of hinted at that type of stuff before. We saw in the very first episode when Rutherford and um, I always forget the name of the ensign that's uh, at the helm went on their little date and they all the zombies and things were going on. But in the midst of all of that, they were engaging with one another, seeming to be attracted to one another. That didn't work out. But then a few episodes later, we saw something, you know, again with Rutherford and this time with Tendi, where Rutherford was willing to give it all up in engineering to try to find some other way to spend more time with Tendi. Now, again, that could be just, you know, the love of friendship, which is perfectly great, um, or it could be something else. Who knows? Maybe. And then the big one was a few episodes ago, we saw where there was something happening between Beckett Mariner and our first officer ransom, to which I immediately threw my hands up and said, no, we cannot have this. Beckett, stay away from him, Mariner. We do not need any ransom. <laughs> and then you all uh, on YouTube, in a great non-spoilery way, you all put in the comments, well, wait a minute. Uh, why don't you give Ransom a chance? Ransom might be more than he appears. And those hints that I love and appreciate so much made me say, you know what? They know, they know. So I'm going to keep an open mind. I'm going to take the advice and view Ransom through the lens of somebody that doesn't have a preconceived notion of an asshole. <laughs> Okay, so um, I can't wait for that. And again, I've been fooled before by these writers. Uh, Temporal Edict, I thought it was time travel. It was a scheduling thing, <laughs> you know? So it says Cupid's Errant Arrow. This could probably have nothing to do with love. But if it does, oh my friends, I will react to that and you will see it. So enough of that. Let's, that's my speculation. Let's get into the facts of the episode and see where the writers want to take both the Cerritos and us on this journey. My friends, if you could do me a favor and a kindness, hit that like button, smash that subscribe, ring that bell for notifications for whenever we go live here on YouTube with any Star Trek or sci-fi related content. And if you would like a longer format or, you know, be able to talk and react over on Patreon, we have our full length watch alongs and reactions over there where I hope to be a few episodes ahead um, in the very near future. We are, uh, I'm posting over there daily. The library and the community is growing. We would love to have you. But but my friends, that is then, this is now, I'm ready for Star Trek Lower Decks Season 1, Episode 5, Cupid's Errant Arrow. Let's see what we have. Only one thing left to do, engage maximum warp reaction. And away we go. <laughs> No cold open. No cold open. What? I don't know how to feel about that. I don't know how to feel about that. I, I don't, I'm, I'm on my heels now without a cold open. I don't know what to do. I do know one thing, I love this show you could be in command of a controls the tides for our summer crop my family has lived on that moon for generations moons can't plummet that's something the government made up to control us I... oh boy <laughs> i'm with you i'm with you freeman i get to have lunch with the coolest smartest officer in starfleet barbara brinson barbara brinson happens to be my girlfriend that's right what Sorry, but I'm starting to think that Barb might not actually exist. Oh, oh my God. She's as real as a hopped up queue on Captain Picard Day. Let me guess. When we meet her, it'll weirdly have to be on the holodeck. That ship on the fleet has its own scent. I think the Cerrito smells like toasting marshmallows. Well, Rutherford, there's a fire right now. I can't believe it. This is the greatest ship I've ever seen. Are you kidding me? This is amazing. Uh, Marpole. 
with kiss, did you say? Hi, sorry. Oh, she's a lieutenant. I'm Lieutenant Barbara Brinson. Um, I'm a, I'm Beckett Mariner, and this uh, is Boimler. Yeah, I know. Oh, I can't wait to show you everything. Come on. She is a lieutenant? Yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, that's Get up here. We're going to be working together. Oh. Whoa. Uh, really? Uh oh. Did you hear some purple people are throwing a tantrum? Implosion's been postponed. We got to recalibrate the whole goddamn containment field. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I like the guy. Nothing compared to my Bradward. <laughs> Bradward? Feels so good to be near you. <laughs> Barb, what's going on here? Well, I got to hand it to you. You were right. Barb is great. A little too great. What's going on, Beckett? I'm gonna have you two run diagnostics on the simulation mainframe. You both comfortable using T eighty eight? Yes, sir. So Oh my god, T eighty eights, that's the new one, right? I mean keep, like you keep it. Ah, uh, sorry, sir. Just checking if this is a dream. I can't believe she used to date Jet. That guy's like a Kirk Sunday with Trip Tucker sprinkles. Trip Tucker! <laughs> I think she's a secret alien who's gonna eat you, or a Romulan spy, or a salt succubus, or an android, or a changeling, or one of those sexy people in rompers that murders you just for going on the grass. Whoa, 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 I'm sorry. Oh my god, I do remember that one from Next Generation. I have seen stuff, man. Like back when I was serving on the keto. Oh my god, we get a flashback! Murder flashback! <laughs> You hear what happened on the Enterprise? Apparently, Data's got an evil twin brother who teamed up with the Borg. Man, it's like a... I'm not gonna sit around and let a face get melted. Not again. You're not leaving my sight, mister. Every minute. Oh my god. You gotta do something. And so do I. Oh, Beckett. Please be right. I, as much as I hate to say it, please be right. No, you don't understand. This moon blocks pollution from Mixtus 3 from reaching my people on Mixtus 2. Without this moon, we'll perish. I mean, it's a pollutant problem? That seems easier than a moon crashing into something. Blood on your hands! See, this is politics. You cannot please everybody all the time. Brad, um, what are you doing here? Oh, uh, you know. <laughs> Beckett creeping by in the back. Oh. Whoa, whoa, stop it, stop it, turn it off. What are you doing? Whoopsie, sorry, new trike order. Okay, she's not an android, because that tone would have disrupted her positronic brain. She's trying to lure her out. See, I'm thinking that there's not going to be anything up with Barb, and it's going to cost the relationship. 22. So what do they do? Like, what do these T-88s do, or whatever they're called? So, Barb's not a duffy, but I haven't ruled her out as a surgically altered Cardassian. Salt vampire. Computer, analyze the coolest people in Earth history and replicate me in outfit. Oh my god. Hey, Barb, get up in here, girl. I always get so cringy with stuff like this. Like, I should be embarrassed. Whoa! Brad! Oh, 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 no. Oh. He's just covering the beard. No. Did you just pull my hair? Yeah, d yeah, did you just pull her hair? That is messed up, bro. Get out of here before I do a citizen's court martial. I have to go back to work. Uh, I'll, I'll walk you there. No, I can walk myself. Come on, Jet, walk me. Come on, Jet. I can do this myself. Lady. She said you looked sexy. No, there's no way she's human. That's her tell. That's her tell. Stay close, you're safe with me. Mariner. Brad. No, Brad! Oh, Mariner, what's going on? Maybe the captain's making progress. You're all murderers! No, you madmen! You'll have blood on your hands! I don't think so. He's doing great. <laughs> That's it. Keep pushing it in. Uh, are you sure it'll fit? Huh? We'll make it fit. You're not sex? I heard sex. What? Oh. You're not sex? What is going on, Mariner? I thought, th I thought there was a tail. I'm going to tell you something. There's something up with Beckett. I really need some more backstory on Mariner. I really need some more backstory on Mariner. Whoa, what's this? What's this? What? Exoskeletal husk? I wasn't wrong! Barb's a parasite! Bradward! Bradward, wait! Bradward! Bradward! Get out of my way! Move! Move, Jennifer! Jennifer! 
do with that? You know what I can do with I it? I can solve problems. I can figure yeah, out what people are I can solve problems. I don't know what the T-88s do. It's great work, and you finished at the exact same time. Looks like you're both joining the Vancouver. Congratulations. Wait, what do you mean, joining the Vancouver? I told you, whoever finished first would get to keep the T-88 and use it here, on the Vancouver. You left that back part out. Locate Boimler! Oh, crap, 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 crap! Requesting emergency transport! He's on an orbital platform? Patient, uh, Mariner 8! Request denied! Is that a made-up code? Who is this? Clear this channel! I love, oh, I love Mariner. There's, there's something going on with her backstory that will explain this. And it can't just be having lost somebody before. I mean, sure, that has a part to do with it. Have located a very sexy oh my god. No to this and also that. What the fuck am I? <laughs> this is great. This, it's the husk of a neural parasite. I don't care. It's the husk, so where's the parasite? parasite. She's a creature of some sort. Right. Could be Jet. Jet was over there too. It has been a long time since I've taken a lover. Oh my god. Taken a lover. Making love to my lover. Oh, please stop. Stop with the lover. lover. Yes. <laughs> Stay away from him. The Cerritos might be falling apart, but that's kind of awesome, too. It's our job to keep it together. All right, Rutherford, you're an engineer. We have to tell Ron we're staying here. What if what if he gets mad at us? He's a professional. Professionals don't get pissed. What? Yep. What I like the most about this is it shows the difference between command staff on the Vancouver and the Cerritos. Remember how supportive they were of Rutherford? Remember the prime directive? What, what that doesn't even apply here. Captain, we're running out of time. The what about the Vancouver's captain? Is she going to sound off on any of this? Yeah. Hmm? Can Barb take Beckett? Lurking around all day, I thought you were a brain infiltrator. Oh my God, they're the same. What the lurking that was protecting. Finally, I realize you're probably a parasite. Uh, yeah. Oh, bitch, you're the parasite. <laughs> bitch, you're the parasite. The impact on our environment would affect both of us. We'd have to move our whole civilization. I know, but how can? Wait. Both? What, what do you what do you mean both? How many people are in your civilization? Me and my wife. There are two f***ing people on your whole f***ing planet? Well, yes, we're... Carol! Implode the moon. Yep. Implode the moon! Oh, Carol, there are two people. This isn't over. You don't know Boimler like I do. He how, you out. how is she beating Beckett? On her second date, he shook hands with a Lortian's egg sack. Oh, stop. <laughs> it was so pissed. <laughs> Meanwhile, Brad is concussed. You guys have been through a lot together. So yeah. where did the parasite thing come from? You are a human. Yep. Man, I mean, you ever get those feelings like you were just sure about something? Like, I was sure you were a parasite, but you're actually a very nice, attractive human woman. Oh, no. I don't want to stun you. Then don't. Oh, the entire crew. I got the password. It was Riker. No, 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 no. no. He took one. Riker. He took one to the knee. I just want to be back on a smaller ship doing simpler work. And um, throw in a T-88 for each of us. Uh, hey, now, uh, that I can't do. Oh, that's cool. It wasn't like I was using my implant to record all this as evidence for your court-martial. <laughs> nice job, Rutherford. This species reproduces by making their host chemically irresistible. Oh. You think I'd be into a guy just because of his pheromones? Oh, thank God. I was worried you're gonna break up with me. Yeah, listen, Brad. Yeah. Oh. Hey, you'll find someone who loves you without a Guga attached to your skull. Guga. Hey, Mayor, see you next month at the Matari tournament. Oh, you know it. And I'll try not to bring it downtown. <laughs> <laughs> we bonded while you were knocked out. Oh, you were super concussed. I miss that smoky smell. <laughs> yep, a little plasma fire. Um, before we left the Vancouver, I got to something. <gasps> <gasps> you shouldn't have. Well, I figured the Cerritos could use them a lot more than... No, 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 no. I mean, look, I stole a bunch too. What did the T-88s do? Other than apparently everything. Oh my gosh, that was so fast. Oh my gosh. All right, friends. That was the end of Star Trek Lower Decks, Season 1, Episode 5, Cupid's Errant Arrow. And now it is time for us to talk about it. 
Well, hello, my friends. Just got done watching Star Trek Lower Decks Season 1, Episode 5, Cupid's Errant Arrow. Um, at the beginning of all of this, I thought, are we going to get a romance? Are we going to get, you know, some type of hint at a possible relationship? And we did. Um, but again, I'm, I, have, I have numerous questions that don't deal with the relationship or the romance side of what the title implied. Um, I, I was hoping for maybe, you know, again, I go into these things hoping for one thing and then I'm given something else that I end up liking more than what I had originally wished for. And so I think that is similar to what we have in this one. This was a an episode that was akin to the first one as far as its rapid deployment of information and storylines. To me, this might have been the fastest episode. And by that, I mean... For me, this one came, it was so quick. I mean, cut back between Rutherford and Tendy, cut over to uh, Brad and Barb and Beckett, the three Bs, and that entire exchange that was going on there. And then throw in the fact that Freeman is doing these politics to, for this imploding moon. It was just constant, constant, constant storylines that were coming in and reminded me a lot of the first episode. And we just had a lot of stuff, different scenarios, different, you know, what's the T-88, a lot of information coming in, but I've gotten used to it a bit. So I, I'm not as spun up as I was at that first episode. Couple questions though, and I think the question for me is what the one I'm going to start off with. Beckett Mariner obviously likes Brad. And I don't mean romantically likes, I mean protectively likes Brad. As much shit as she gives him and as much kind of fun that she pokes at him, she genuinely cares for Brad, genuinely, because she wouldn't do what she did just for the sake of engagement or adventure or anything like that. Because in this particular episode, you could say, oh, well, she just got it in her head that Barb was a, a creature that needed or an alien that was out to get Brad and she needed to defend him. And that was the the rationale behind her kind of, you know, checking and spying and all that stuff. But that's not the case. Because if we had this in isolation, you could make the argument that it was just more of her desire for adventure that maybe kind of led her to protect Brad, Be protecting Brad being kind of a peripheral thing. But that's not the case because we have seen throughout the, ep the season so far, uh, you know, I've seen five episodes now. And so of those five, any chance Mariner gets, she helps Brad. You know, I think the most... <sighs> The best example for me is then the one that kind of stands as the top that we'll see if it gets supplanted at some point. But the top example is in the episode where, you know, Brad was having such a hard time um, on, on the away mission was they were fearing the Klingon about envoys, I think it was, um, that she, you know, he kept making mistakes. You know, he kept, he, he fell for the uh, uh, person that was going to uh, implant him with eggs with the, the fan that came out. And um, again, like, I don't know this, the species name or anything like that, but I mean, it, it, Brad just had a bad go of it. He had a really bad day where his book smarts did not translate into his actual practical knowledge. And that's, you know, it, it's easy to say that Brad is book smart and Mariner is streetwise, but that's not the case. Uh, Brad is book smart. And Mariner is streetwise and, and you know, uh, very good at like actionable items, you know, uh, uh, an officer of action sort of is Beckett. The thing is, though, Beckett is also brilliant as she's displayed numerous times where she's outquoted regulations to Brad um, in any type of situation that requires some type of scientific kind of work around. She has actionable suggestions that she makes that are, we've seen so far have been accurate. So Beckett is a, a, a fantastic character that doesn't have to have that kind of, you, you can't push everything that Beckett does off on just brashness. You can't push it off on just, you know, uh, a, a need for action, you know, because she she's intelligent. And so what I want to know, and this is my long winded way of saying, yes, does she care for Brad? 100%. I don't think it's romantic at all. Um, I, I mean, could it be romantic at some point? I, I just don't think Brad's the the type of person that, um, uh, you know, I, Barb would be more of the type of person that I would see Beckett falling for. Um, but again, with Beckett, you know, or I mean, in the weird way, Ransom, whenever, you know, she saw Ransom fighting and he was actually, you know, that whole thing, potentially. There's something going on with Beckett's history that we don't know a lot about you know other i mean we know a good bit about beckett a very good bit about 
present day Beckett. And present day Mariner, you know, dad's the admiral, mom's the captain. She's got all these, you know, things going on, problems with authority. If she gets promoted, she wants to be demoted. There has to be a reason for all of that. There has to be, and I know these writers have a reason for this. This isn't just, you know, oh, she hates authority. That's not it. You know, I think that it's easy to think that, oh, she jokes about everything. But I often default whenever somebody is that far one way. And by that, I mean, when Beckett is so far in that kind of Kirk vein, you know, action, um, let's do this, you know, uh, everything is, you know, F authority, you know, it, there are these kind of absolutes that she has in her character build up right now that we're experiencing. There's something that made Mariner that way. There's something that happened that made her the way that she is, where whether it be um, authority that betrayed her, whether it be, you know, a loss of a love of some kind, a loss. I mean, we saw where we had a flashback to her um, and, you know, she lost a friend of hers to that, that shapeshifter. I mean, that's obviously something, but I don't think that it is something that completely defines uh, Mariner. Um, could it, could it add to the story of Beckett Mariner? Absolutely. You know, it, and it seems to me like we're going to see, they're going to kind of, you know, spoon feed us little bits of Mariner. Um, and this is me projecting, they could be, they could go in a completely different direction, but it just seems to me that if this is the way, and I'm starting to sort of get a feel for the writers and how they do things, it seems to me that, you know, at this point they've established a good bit about Beckett being a badass. You know, we, we, it's readily acceptable at this point that Beckett's a badass, but you know, that's the thing about badasses. You weren't a badass from birth. I mean, you might've been, but it's, it's also the same thing that when you see somebody that's that cool as Beckett Mariner, that is that kind of, you know, with it and that together, they didn't, you know, there was a, a struggle to get where she is right now. And I'm not saying that she's completely adjusted by any stretch of the imagination. She's coming across in a way that she wants to, that the, the way that she wants to present herself, she is able to do so. And that in and of itself is a huge accomplishment for somebody that may have experienced some type of trauma in the past. You know, you the fake it till you make it type of thing, where you have these types of, um, th th these things, these, these, these bruises on your soul that you have to, you know, do a workaround. There's either the, you know, if, if it's some type of, you know, a, a mental health or trauma or PTSD or something like that, um, you know, it has to be worked through. It has to be, you know, whether it's being therapy or, or the, you know, some type of counselor like we see in Star Trek, these things need to be worked through, but the, the knee jerk, you know, uh, is to cover it up. The knee jerk is if I can build this sort of facade of myself, then I can keep the facade up while I work on me. Or sometimes I can keep the facade up and I don't have to work on me. And underneath all of this, I'm in, I'm in deep shit. And I just, I, I'm, I, and again, this is easily could be me projecting and Mariner's exactly the way that she's presented, but it just seems to me that these writers are too good for that. They're too good to have a very kind of one dimensional character. Like, you know, oh, she's a badass and she hates authority. If that was all Beckett Mariner was, then I think it would quickly become stale. And I think that we've seen too many hints of, you know, past failures. Maybe that's the best way to put it that have kind of set up the Beckett that we see. And those past failures could easily be the reasons for demotion. Maybe she was promoted and somebody under her command died. I don't know this. And this is, I have deliberately stayed away from any, I don't even look things up on Google. I don't, you know, if I go into, you know, I get any type of information on anything Star Trek nowadays, I always put non-spoilers in the title. And I've actually stopped doing that because what I found is whenever I look something up, it'll, you know, if I want to look up something for this particular episode, it will tell me, you know, I'll see something for this particular episode and then they'll reference something, you know, two seasons from now. And that, you know, I just can't have that happen. And that happened for me in the original series when I was, I had something spoiled for me that takes place, I think in season two. And I decided, especially with Lower Decks, when I started the first one, I'm like, I'm looking nothing up 
for lower decks because I don't want any of this ruined. That's why I don't know the Easter eggs. You know, I could easily go and look them up and, you know, point, pretend like I'm smart and say, hey, well, that's that. And I did recognize the salt monster, but, um, you know, it, it's just something that requires a, a little bit of subtlety when I'm doing this. And I don't, I don't want to have Boimler, Rutherford, Tendi, and especially Mariner stories ruined because they are, to me, fascinating, fascinating characters. And I said it in the last reaction, Beckett Mariner is one of the best Star Trek characters I've come across in quite some time. Where Brad pretty much is one dimensional as far, I mean, he might have more going on um, that we know about, and I'm sure he does because the writers wouldn't just give us Brad Boimler. But I think that Brad is <laughs> flawed enough that um, we're seeing pretty much the most of Brad. I'm sure he has some secrets left in him, but we're seeing pretty much Brad is who he is. Same thing with Rutherford and Tendi. I think they are who they are. You know, with Tendi in the last episode, we saw some of her foil or uh, foibles, you know, the need for acceptance. That's a powerful one. That's, a you know, in a, many ways, it's a weakness that that need for acceptance. Um, and so that's kind of a flaw in her character, you know, but that makes her so much more realistic and, and relatable. And that's why I know that the writers would not present us with a Beckett Mariner who was just a badass, who was just, you know, can fight, can come up with all this stuff, hates authority. That seems too easy for them. And I think that we have some more coming in. And that's what this entire episode sort of told me. You know, the, the stuff between um, Captain Freeman and the alien race and the moons, that, that's humorous. Um, the stuff between Rutherford and Tendi and the T-88s and the transfer and all of that stuff, that was character building. You know, we got to see some more interactions between Tendi and Rutherford um, and, you know, their growing friendship and the, the strength of that friendship in the face of, you know, they have so many similarities, wanting to stay on the Cerritos and all that stuff. And that helps to, again, flesh out their characters and specifically the relationship between those two, strengthened with the B-plot perfect you know i mean it's uh, these writers know exactly what they're doing they are they are yeah. their construction of the episodes and so far the season is highly intelligent and incredibly impressive especially with the short period of time that they have to work with but beckett beckett is to me and it has been since the beginning not somebody that seems to be what they present themselves to the galaxy as you know, it, it, I don't want to say it's a cover, and I don't think that that Beckett is, is you know, you know, grieving or or, um, you know, uh, having you know a conflict of conscience or anything like that 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 she's kind of walling off the rest of the universe for. But there's definitely something there. There's something there. Otherwise, she wouldn't have reacted the way she did to Barb. You know, that need to protect, that need to. And we saw a flashback where she failed, sort of. Now, it wasn't her fault, but failed to recognize the shapeshifter and it cost her friend her life. And that could easily be, you know, oh, well, she didn't want a repeat of that. I mean, come on, that's that's the reason, right? Yeah, sure, absolutely. And if you told me that, I'd, I'd agree with you. Yeah, that could easily be the moment that sh this whole episode kind of spun itself up around. She didn't want a repeat of that. But it just seems that she made that that launch very quickly. And then she went overboard into her pursuit and her investigation. Um, and again, that could be just the protection of Brad. But that just seems, you know, they they gave her the circles under the eyes. You know what I mean? They, they made her almost look manic in a way, you know, where she became less of the Beckett Mariner that we've had, less sure of herself, um, less seemingly physically in control. And it's it's something to really, I'm going to pay attention to because I want to see if this is something that they build off of. Um, and so for that in and of itself, Cupid's Errant Arrow, episode five of season one, for me is a potential turning point for Beckett. It's a potential turning point where in the future, if we see something similar or something that hints at something like this, we can point back to this episode and say, here, Here's where we, we've had a little kind of touches from it before, but here's almost where the book was cracked a little bit. And we, we went back to the early chapters of the story of Beckett Mariner and we got a quick peek, you know, just a whoop, whoop. And so episode five could be the part where we look back and we say, I see what they were doing. 
I think we're going to see that. And I think we're going to be able to, again, look back at this episode and realize the brilliance again of these writers and these characters. I, I, I am, I couldn't be more excited for this series. Um, I love Strange New Worlds. I love it. I, I uh, unapologetically love Strange New Worlds. And I am I'm really, really enjoying the original series and the animated series. Um, wasn't a huge fan of Charlie X, but I still enjoyed watching it. I still enjoyed experiencing all those characters. With all that being said, and the love for Star Trek, it, for me, is growing daily, if not by the minute. Lower Decks is absolutely fascinating to me. Because I think it is so nuanced and it's 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 shelled behind this great shield of comedy, you know, where we laugh and ah ha ha. But there's there's a level of tension, there's a level of stakes that shouldn't exist in a comedy show, but does. And there is depth and breadth of character that shouldn't exist in a cartoon or, or in a comedy show where we're just going for the ha ha's and the he he's. No. There's way more going on here, way more. And you know why I know that? Because you wonderful people on YouTube in a non-spoilery fashion have guided me back when I've kind of gotten a little bit into the weeds with this stuff. You told me with Ransom, well, you know what, no spoilers, but um, give Ransom a chance. And I knew then when I had several of those comments pop up that you all have my back and you're trying to tell me Keep an open mind. There is more to Ransom than we've seen so far, or that might be just, you know, preconceived. And because of that, I know there has to be more to Beckett Mariner, too, and more to Brad Boimler, more to Rutherford, and more to Tendi. And I can't wait to learn that. But I also want to take my time and enjoy this experience with you all. <sighs> my friends, if you stuck around this long, do me a kindness, hit that like button, hit subscribe, ring the bell for notifications. So whenever we go live here on YouTube for more Star Trek or science fiction content, you'll be right there with us. And if you'd like longer format for our full length watch alongs and reactions, join us over on Patreon, link down in the description. I'm gonna try to keep pumping these lower decks out as fast as I can, simply because I love them too much to put a pause on them by the week. So as the community and the library grows, know that Lower Decks is going to be at the forefront of all of it because it is a, for me, a generational show. This is something that um, for this particular generation of Star Trek, I think holds all the promise in the world. And I can't wait to see that realized in ways that I have never predicted. I'm sure it'll be completely different than what I thought, and I'll love it all the more. My friends, thank you very much. And until next time, Vulcan roll, my friends, and I'm out.